This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Everyone, uh, I hope you guys had a good lunch. I, uh, I personally enjoyed the cheese very much. Uh, it's rare that I come to Paris, so every time I do, I try to make sure I get some cheese. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, welcome. Um, my name is uh, Saim Said. I'm the new agriculture editor. Uh, new because I think I only got in the role like less than a month ago. So I'm pretty sure there's a lot more knowledge uh, in this room than I have. Um, so before we get to the next panel, which Barthosh uh, will uh, host again on food labeling, I just wanted to introduce you to uh, our leading partner, Yara. And uh, I'll introduce you to uh, Monica Andres Enriquez, who will be joining us on screen, uh, who is the Executive Vice President of Europe uh, for Yara. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. You had bread for lunch today, right? Imagine a world in the future where that bread will have a 12% less carbon footprint. And imagine that the farmer growing the wheat for that bread would ha have achieved 20% of carbon footprint reduction, maintaining the yields and also the quality. You know, Yara is in the progress to realize that future. And it's with the use of green fertilizers. Yara mission is responsibly feed the world and protect the planet. And with that, we are fully committed to decarbonize the food chain, but also to guarantee the food security that is currently under risk and to achieve a robust and resilient food chain. But we cannot do that alone, but with only with collaboration all along the chain. So let's think together about these three main topics during these days of summit. So how can we collaborate? We are committed in Yara to reduce the carbon footprint in our production sites, but also we are committed to empowering the farmers to reduce the carbon footprint in their fields. In the production sites, we started. Good afternoon, everyone. You had bread for lunch today, right? Good afternoon, everyone. You had bread for lunch today, right? Imagine a world in the future where that bread will have a 12% less carbon footprint. And imagine that the farmer growing the wheat for that bread would ha have achieved 20% of carbon footprint reduction maintaining the yields and also the quality. You know, Yara is in the progress to realize that future. And it's with the use of green fertilizers. Yara mission is responsibly feed the world and protect the planet. And with that, we are fully committed to decarbonize the food chain, but also to guarantee the food security that is currently under risk and to achieve a robust and resilient food chain. But we cannot do that alone, but with only with collaboration all along the chain. So let's think together about these three main topics during these days of summit. So how can we collaborate? We are committed in Yara to reduce the carbon footprint in our production sites, but also we are committed to empowering the farmers to reduce the carbon footprint in their fields. 
In the production sites, we started the journey some years ago. Only since 2005 until today, we have reduced by 55% the carbon footprint. And we have more ambitious targets in the years to come. The way to achieve that would be by moving out of fossil fuel and being replaced by renewable electricity. With that, we will reduce and we can reduce up to 80 to even 90 percent. That means a game changer because we believe that it's the only way that the decarbonization of the food is possible by the use of these green fertilizers. I'm happy to say that by 2023, Yara will have already green fertilizers in the marketplace in Europe. There are huge opportunities to decarbonize by finding the right business models with member states, with policymakers, and throughout the whole value chain. Let's ask ourselves, how can we stop wasting the waste? In Yara, we believe that it would be through strategic partnerships, leveraging our crop knowledge and also by identifying optimal ways to recycle nutrients. One illustration of that is the partnerships with Veolia, that is a global resource recovery company. We have a project that have initiated in London together, and it's about uh, recycling food waste from the city of London. And with that, we will produce organic mineral fertilizers. It's a very important project, groundbreaking pilot, I would say. And with that, we think that we can be, uh, we can scale it further. And that is not the only initiative that we have in the organic field. We have launched in several countries in Europe as well, organic-based fertilizers, because we believe that they will complement the current offering. And we also will improve the soil health. That is one of our concerns in Europe. With all of this, we are embracing as a strategic priority the circular economy because we have a commitment with our farmers on circular economy as well, on recycling goods. There are significant synergies out of the use of organic-based fertilizers, and we are partners for all farmers in Europe. How can we make every nutrient count? Over the last two years, External shocks have exposed the weaknesses in the food system and accelerated the urgency for a change. In Europe, we must rebuild our food sovereignty and accelerate the transformation to a more sustainable and resilient food system. Yara empowers the farmers throughout digital tools, fertilizer ranges, and also with agronomical advice. One of the most popular digital tools that we have is at farm. And with that, the farmers can achieve an improvement of their yields up to 6%, whilst reducing the fertilizer application by 12%. There is a way, so, to reduce the nutrient losses. That is one of the goals of farm to fork And there is a way to achieve that not compromising the yields. But again, we cannot do it alone. It will be only in partnerships and collaboration all along the food chain. It will be through the CAP, the Common Agriculture Policy, and also the countries and also the regional schemes that will accelerate this further. Let's take action now. And I invite you to visit our Yara booth. Thank you very much. Yeah, so welcome back and um, hope you enjoyed uh, the, the message from Yara on green fertilizers. Um, now we're going to uh, jump into um, kind of the, uh, the re retail angle to it. So um, front of pack labeling and the other labeling initiatives that the commission is working on. 
for those who don't know me, I'm Bartosz. Um, I moderated the previous panel, but failed to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a new agri-food reporter at Politico. Um, yeah, so um, the, the European Commission, among the various initiatives of the Farm to Fork and the Green Deal, um, is currently working on a mandatory front-of-pack label proposal for um, for foods across across the EU for for processed foods. Um, with the aim of improving uh, consumer understanding of nutritional values um, and also stimulating food reformulation, so changing those recipes to be healthier, um, and of course facilitating healthier food choices. There are various proposals already out there, various models that are adopted by, by some member states voluntarily for now, um, including NutriScore in France and several other countries, uh, Nutri-Informed Battery in Italy, uh, the Nordic countries have their own keyhole, I believe it's called, um, for po alternative. So, so there are several circulating out there already. And of course, the commission now wants to create a harmonized one. So with me uh, today, we have, um, starting kind of unusually out of order a bit, but we have the person who's uh, kind of in charge of this commission proposal, Claire Berry from uh, DG Sante. And uh, we also have, to my left, Chantal Julia, who's um, a member of the scientific team that developed the NutriScore, so the, the French kind of nutri nutritional model that's apparently or widely seen as one of the top contenders to be the model to be adopted as this harmonized label. So um, to her left, we have, a, a, we, sorry, we have Vincenzo Celeste, who's uh, uh, in the foreign ministry of Italy, and um, he's been kind of, you've been kind of almost like crusading um, across Europe to promote an alternative model to NutriScore, which is the Nutri-Informed Battery. Uh, and I think, I think it's, it's, it's really, in Brussels especially, we often, we often see this very kind of contentious debate whether it's, it should be NutriScore or, or Nutri-Informed Battery or another model. Um, and finally, um, we have Adrian from, uh, who's an MEP, um, from Renew, and you've been very actively working uh, on, or you've been looking at NutriScore, you've been looking at this food labeling, front of pack food labeling discussion, debate a process for quite a while already. You've published op opinion pieces on why NutriScore may not be the most optimal option. You've taken quite a strong stance on, on some of the issues, including how it uh, might, how, how, how a food labeling scheme might affect um, regional products, um, products from the south of Europe, the Mediterranean diet is one of the issues that you've uh, talked about. I want to start with Claire. Um, what can you tell us about the upcoming proposal? Uh, it's, in, it's in the pipeline for December. Is it still in the pipeline? Where are we now? What, do you, what can you tell us? Okay, so uh, it's very definitely still in the pipeline, sorry. Um, <clears throat> we are in the process at the moment of going through the impact assessment. Um, we actually had a discussion um, at lunch on Monday amongst the ministers, and one of the things that they underlined was that they want a very uh, thorough impact assessment on this proposal, so that's uh, what we are doing uh, at the moment. Um, there are a couple of parts of the information that we still need to complete, uh, in particular around digital labelling, how useful that can be. At the moment, what we see is that uh, it's mainly when the information's on the label that the consumers look at it. Uh, but obviously, things have changed maybe on digital over the past couple of years. We need to check what's going on there. Um, and we also um, need, I think, to be sure about the impact of different logos on consumers. So if we were to change the logo, how recognizable would that be? Because obviously, there are um, labels that are in, in the market already for a while. So we're um, going through all that. Um, as the Commissioner said on Monday, from our point of view, the more consumers know, the better the choices they will make. But of course, the information has to be concise, it has to be impactful uh, for them. Um, there are two reasons why we think we should act now. The first is that member states are developing lots of different schemes, uh, be it on the nutrition labelling, be it on alcohol, be it on the date marking. I can come back to that at some point. So really, the time is right for Europe to go forward. Also, we don't have much time left in the mandate of this Council and Parliament. Um, and secondly, of course, food waste is right at the top of the political agenda now uh, because of the food security issues. 
Um, and what we've seen is that if we can do something to improve the date marking, I think we can make a difference there. So impact assessment moving forward. Um, what's been said is it could be the end of this year, beginning of next. Uh, I think the progress confirms that that's when it will come, but obviously it's for final political decision, and it'll depend on the usual thing of takeoff slots in the Commission though, when, we, when we get the, uh, the moment. Uh, but it's definitely on track. Are there any, is there any information, any evidence that you're still kind of missing or that you're still hesitant about? Um... No, I mean, we have a lot of evidence. We now have scientific evidence from EFSA. Um, we have empirical evidence. We have modeling evidence. Um, there is a lot of data out there. As I said, I think the only two are final missing pieces, and they really don't affect the impact assessment. We've looked at all the different types of labeling schemes, uh, including the nutrient form battery, and we've looked at the pros and cons, and we've seen what evidence is out there. Um, there's, as I say, a little bit still outstanding on the digital side, um, and, and also in terms of what the impact, in terms of the visuals of any logo would be uh, on consumers. But, most of the evidence is already there. Um, we have, I think, strong evidence from the WHO and the OECD uh, that the front of pack label with an evaluative scheme can have an impact. Of course, it's not the only thing that influences consumer choices. I mean, when you go, of course, that's one thing you look at. We know that consumers look at price as well, and they will increasingly look at price given the current situation that we're in. Uh, it's also a question of tastes. It's a question of habits. Um, so we know that this is not the only thing that consumers use, uh, but we have now, I think, quite a body of evidence that shows that um, the front of pack labelling can have an impact and it will have health consequences afterwards as well. Thank you. Um, Chantal, I wanted to... You're one of the people working on developing uh, NutriScore, one of the people behind it. What makes it the most suitable choice uh, for, for this kind of uh, model? Well, front pack labeling has, well, discussion in the scientific field on front pack labeling actually has been going on for more than 30 years. The Nutri score was initially developed in 2013, so we almost have 10 years now of scientific research behind it. What we know is that the target is important. What we believe is that information is very well. It's good to inform consumers. We have now labels that inform, have purely informative information on nutrient content per portion, and we know that they do not change consumer behavior. They have limited impact on consumer behavior, mostly because also they only be, they can only be manipulated by people that have extensive education in nutrition, which is not the case of the overall population. So the target is important. We believe that it's, for now, the strategies that have been developed tend to favor those that are already having healthier diets. So we need to look for those that do not necessarily have any nutritional education. And in this case, that's the reason why we developed something that is a summary graded information, because it provides both information for the healthier products and information for the less healthy products. So it needs to rely on the nutrient profiling model. Again, 20 years of research in nutrient profiling model. We know that it's important to inform on both nutrients of concern, sugars, salt, fats, but also nutrients to favor, for example, fibers or proteins. So the NutriScore is the overall combination of all of this. And it has been extensively validated. We both validated the nutrient profiling model, showing that changing diets towards foods that are healthier according to the classification by the NutriScore can lead to improved outcomes in terms of nutritional chronic diseases, weight gain, cardiovascular disease. This has been validated in both France, Spain, Italy, or even in European cohorts. So this is the part on the nutritional profile of the model. But then in terms of the graphical format, it has been shown to be easily accessible, preferred, and leads to higher impacts in terms of modification of behavior in terms of purchasing situations. What about, what about those concerns, um, not just from uh on the political side, but also uh, recent NGOs led study that looked into um, NutriScore highlighted that um, it, for example, fails to really uh, look at the level of processing that goes into a product, uh, and they almost they, they really called it a threat to public health. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, what do you make of those kind of concerns that there are still gaps even in NutriScore? Well, that the NutriScore. 
sorry, I have them here, that the Nutri-Score is not taking into account all of the dimension of the food. Yes, it only takes into account the nutritional part of the food, which is the part for which we have the most scientific evidence. In terms of ultra-processing, it has been developed in the last five to six years. It, it, we do have a lot of information, a lot of evidence around ultra-processed foods and their impact on health. But this is a dimension that is not necessarily collinear with nutritional they are complementary. Both are important for health. So we shouldn't consider that one is above the other. Both need to be considered. And even if a food is not ultra-processed, it can still be full of salt or sugar or fat. It's not going to help in terms of health in the end. So both informations are important. For now, the nutrition school relies on the elements for which we have the most evidence. And from a scientific basis, for now, we don't have ways of accurately combining both of these dimensions. Vincenzo, are you, are you convinced? Are you for Nutri-Score now? <laughs> no. <laughs> the, short, the short answer is no. The, the, long, the longest is uh, going back to the uh, target, which is um, uh, that, that the we all want to achieve through the farm of to fork strategy, which is uh, to uh, push consumers towards healthy diets, okay? And uh, uh, the, uh, our assessment is that the, uh, the intrinsic logic of the Nutri-Score is not guaranteeing that this target is achieved, because it's, uh, it's basically um, an instrument, a tool, which is directing the consumer on the basis of uh, the consideration of, uh, uh, let's say, arbitrary uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the single product, and uh, is not considering the collocation of the single food, I mean, single element of, uh, of uh, what we eat in, uh, in the context of uh, a balanced, healthy diet. Uh, there are there's plenty of, uh, of examples of uh, uh, green graded uh, uh, food in uh, in uh, Nutri-Score, which have uh, less poor or, if any, uh, nutritional value. So what we see is that we are, of course, in favor of uh, an, uh, uh, the need to tackle obesity, to tackle overweight. We, of course, are supporting the idea of an harmonized. Uh, labeling for uh, for food, but this should help and assist, and let's say in some way guide the uh, consumer towards combining uh, uh, the nutrients, I mean the the aliment, in uh, 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 healthy in the healthy context. I mean, there is plenty of uh, different um, nutritional profile, I mean, diets like Mediterranean or Nordic diets, where, which are full of uh, uh, products which be graded C or D in Nutri-Score, and yet, whether they, if they are combined in, uh, in, uh, in the right, in the right uh, quantity, in the right portions, uh, they would produce a diet, a final diet, which is healthy, which has been recognized as healthy by, by scientists. I think on the Mediterranean diet, I think, uh, Adrian, you can, you can probably weigh in. Uh, you've, you've written an op-ed I've seen in the past. Uh, what's your take on, on this whole debate, uh, also between even the two contenders f for, for the kind of approach to be taken? Where do you what's your take on this? I, I was, uh, while I was listening to them, I was thinking of Saim, that he said that he so much enjoyed the cheese that we had. Today, and, and probably he knows that 90% of the French cheese, they are rated D or E under Nutri-Score. But if you ask him how happy made you to have that cheese today, <laughs> he will put an A. And I think happiness and that kind of, uh, of mental uh, attitude is also healthy. So um, beyond, and jokes aside, I think that Vincenzo explained pretty well that Nutri-Score, of course, it has its flaws. It doesn't take into account the quantity that you consume on any given product. It doesn't take into account uh, many harmful additives or even mm, endocrine disruptors. So it's not a perfect tool to do this. Um, and beyond that, I'm going a little bit with what uh, Claire said. Um, 
I think that we all agree here that we have to harmonize that. We have an internal market, so it just makes sense that we have a common front pack labeling. So we all agree on that. The thing is, we have to find a way that does not polarize mm, cultures, member states, because in South, replying to your question, in Italy, in Portugal, in Spain, we're very proud of our gastronomy and, and how we eat our Mediterranean diet. And if you took Nutri-Score to evaluate that, it means that Mediter Mediterranean diet is not that good anymore. And not only that, I think that it has a, a lot of ideological uh, um, weight on it. Because if you ask me, I think that we have to give the tools to the consumers to be better informed whether they want to do a healthier choice or not. But you just cannot put something there that what is going to create them is to feel guilty when they pick a particular product. And I'm going to just finish by putting on an example. I, I live in Belgium. And in Belgium, there is a chain of supermarkets that they use heavily Nutri-Score. They use it so heavily that when you get into a supermarket, they say, you have 10 or 20% discount if you buy all A's and B's, which means that maybe they are not pushing only for your health, but maybe for their uh, sales, that one thing. And the other thing is, I know about Nutri-Score. I have had debates with many people that have worked in Nutri-Score with companies that they do heavily food processing, which Curiously enough, they all have A and Bs on the products. And, and when I go to, to, to this supermarket in Belgium, I took the other day a, a bottle of orange juice, and then I turned, and it was a C. And I, I was five seconds deciding if I should pick it up or not. It's a C. So even myself, that's know the system, is creating on me a sense that I'm not picking right. And I think that we have to treat citizens as adults, and we shouldn't educate them, just inform them. But it looks like it's, Nutri-Score is simple enough for you to pay attention to it then, and, and think about the, the, what, what the implications of it are. Uh, Vincenzo, uh, tell us in a really, in, in, as in one short sentence, what makes Nutri-Inform battery the alternative that Italy has come up with more effective? L listen, we are, we are, we are been working on, on Nutri-Inform as a possible alternative. I don't mean that this is, this will be the, the ideal alternative, uh, but it's much closer to what, I mean, to the logic I was referring to before, uh, in the sense that the idea is to put the uh, products in the context of, uh, of a diet, of what, what is the intake uh, the, in the overall balance of a diet uh, uh, in a daily, in a daily, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, actually, I don't know if you've ever been in, uh, to, um, to visit, I mean, to a nutritionist. I was there. The, uh, the, basic, uh, the basic idea, of course, he will tell you that there are some products that you should avoid. Among these, there are some uh, green graded in uh, Nutri-Score, by the way. Uh, but the most important thing is, are two things, are portions, and the balance, I mean, combination of products. This means that if really our target is to tackle overweight, to tackle obesity and, non, uh, and all the related non-communicable disease, we should work more in orienting and, and, and uh, 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 educating consumers, pushing them towards a healthy diet. So also the labeling should be uh, functional, sh instrumental to this, to this final, uh, final uh, uh, goal. And uh, as regards Newton form, of course it is, uh, has been developed, I repeat, uh, it's not color coded, so on, on this, uh, 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 it's trying to treat consumers more uh, as adults, as uh, Adrian was just <laughs> saying. Uh, but I repeat, I mean, it's, it's not the only alternative. What is important is to establish what is the, the correct logic in, uh, in tackling the, the problem. Uh, I'll let Chantal weigh in in a second on, 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 on the comments. But uh, it seems like uh, the European Food Safety authority, uh, they issued the scientific evidence for the process recently, and one of the key things that they highlighted was that simplicity, the color coding. A lot of the things that, when I was reading it, thinking like, oh yeah, they're not saying 
which one's better, but they are kind of saying which one's better. Um, so um, on that, <laughs> Chantal, how do you respond to uh, to these concerns? Also, especially kind of the kind of issues where you may have a theoretically unhealthy product that's, that has a higher rating than, uh, than, a, than something like an orange juice. Um, well, I heard multiple things. Um, first, uh, the question, I don't know how to respond them in order. Uh, first, yes, the fact that you looked at it and you saw it and that the sea actually drew your, atten drew your attention, yes. Colors work. They make people reflect on what they eat. But it doesn't mean that the Nutri-Score is by any way an absolute value of the food. It doesn't say that E, sh you should not eat it at all. And A is the only thing that you should be eating. The message behind it, and it, then it aligns completely with dietary recommendations, is that A and B is usually are consumed in more frequency and larger amounts in the Mediterranean diets legumes, fruit and vegetables, whole grain products, fish, they are all rated A and B, so it's completely in line. And on the other, on the olive oil is still 100% fat first, so you do eat it, but in lower quantities, and this is exactly the information that is provided by the Nutri-Score. D and E's are not to be avoided entirely, but need to be reflected in terms of portion sizes or frequency. It's the same for cheese. I do hope that you didn't gorge on cheese completely. It's, <laughs> it's a rare treat at the end of the, <laughs> of the meal. So it does, it is aligned in terms of communication. We do need to improve the way that we communicate towards how to be using the Nutri-Score as not an absolute value and this is good and this is bad. It really is to be reframed in the question of the overall diet. On the question of portions, I'm glad that you were able to go to a nutritionist, but unfortunately it's not the case for the entire population and thankfully so because I would not want to have all the population to go to a nutritionist. Being educated on nutrition, on dietary balance, on the types of portion sizes is a very long-term process, and not everyone has a priority towards nutrition in their diets. So it's important that we do that, take that into account, and that we actually frame the various policies according to their objective. The Nutri-Score has a clear one that is to guide at the one point of purchase in which we make decisions in seconds. Tackling the question of the portion sizes, the way you balance your diet, this is a long-term process that needs additional information. Food-based dietary guidelines remain the overall structure of the diet. But then you need to have an additional element to help in guidance in specific food choices elements. So again, to go with what was said initially, it's an overall strategy that we need. Front pack labeling is just one of the elements. Food-based dietary guidelines are paramount. We need to continue to educate the population. The question is, is front to pack really a tool of education or is it something else? Claire, you've, take, you've been taking notes, you've been nodding. Um, what's your take on what you've heard today? Is there anything that strikes you as... as First of all, on the evaluative schemes, and, I, and I'm not defending Nutri-Score, I want to be clear at this point now. On evaluative schemes, um, it gives summary information, as you said. Sometimes it's a bit too simplistic, no, I think, but it does make the consumer stop and think. And to go back to what you were saying, we know that the average consumer in the supermarket takes two to three seconds to decide what they take off the shelf. So you've got that moment to influence them. Huh? But then, of course, it's not only about that moment, no, it's about same with his cheese and how much of it he takes, how often he eats it and whatever. Um, and very often these dietary recommendations, of course, we, we will, whatever scheme is put in place, consumers will need to understand it better. I mean, I'm with you there, Vincente, no? I mean, you can't just put the scheme out there. And I think this is what has been said in Italy as well. No, you need information around that scheme and what it means. But I'm with you in the fact that we need everybody across the population to get access to information. No, we have to popularize it as much as possible. Um, is the algorithm perfect? Perfect. No, no algorithm is perfect, and it can certainly be improved on, and I think that needs to be done. The, prans the, the process, any, any algorithm behind any evaluative scheme, the process needs to be transparent. There needs to be much more clarity about what goes into it. Um, but third, um, it's about diet, but it's also about lifestyle as well. No, it's about sport, it's about health, and you know, it's all part of that, that, that big whole. So does it change everything? Will it be a revolution? No. 
Can it change some behaviour input? Yes. I mean, what we see from the shopping basket trials that have been done on the evaluative schemes is that it does have an impact on what people purchase and what they put in the basket. So it's, it almost seems like it's just a small step to, uh, or a small tool that's supposed to help with the larger, uh, larger processes. And yet, when you mention Nutri-Score to certain agricultural ministers, a, a growing number of agricultural ministers, it seems that is the trigger word that is, uh, that is kind of uh, heating up also in, in Parliament, um, in national politics. I mean, it's, it's one of the, it was among the most discussed wards in the elections, recent elections in Italy, uh, Nutri-Score, not food labeling, not uh, European Commission's proposal, the word Nutri-Score itself. Um, so um, I wonder if, if, Vincenzo, if you have a take on what, what Claire said or? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, a couple of things. One is about what uh, Claire, but also Chantal, they were just saying, I mean, of course, labeling is just one, uh, one tool, and we should uh, avoid any temptation to believe that uh, labeling is the silver bullet uh, to achieve the, uh, the, final, uh, the final goal. Uh, and here, probably, and we should also encourage the Commission to propose also in other area projects which are aimed to uh, foster the food culture, food education, of people, there are funds in the in the EU budget to, for for this. We should probably make much more use and to create a real strategy. Uh, on the uh, on on the fact of on, on the Nutri Score, just to complement what I was uh, just saying, uh, I want to remember one decision which has been taken uh, some some de decisions which have been taken by the Italian Authority for Competition just recently, banning. Uh, Nutri-score used by some uh, 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 chains. Banning or? Uh... I mean, the, uh, there were some uh, companies who proposed a number of measures, of remedies, which is uh, called in the jargon of the competition, uh, uh, and uh, which uh, 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 have been accepted. The, the basic idea is that the Nutri-score is considered by the authority as misleading. Why? Because it creates the false impression that everything which is green is good in absolute terms in nutritional profile, which is not true. It's simply fake, false. It's something which is not harming you, but is not part of a healthy diet, or not necessarily. Uh, the remedies which are proposed are going around a number of exemptions for a number of products on one side and on the other side of enlarging the information and uh, creating, giving more information about the method which is behind the Nutri-Score labeling on one side and more information about how to put this food in a in the context of uh, a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. So probably in a nutshell, these kind of decisions are in some way uh, confirming from our point of view, of course, what are the concerns which are behind. We are confident that the Commission, which is working very hard on, on this, will be able to, to present a, a good proposal. But I repeat, I mean, as they were saying, we need some more. Adrian, are you, uh, in, in terms of implementation across the EU, I mean, I know you're very interested also in following this, this antitrust uh, um, process in Italy, uh, even though you're from Spain. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, uh, how, how likely is it uh, that an EU-wide label could be implemented given these different markets? Well, it depends what, what the Commission brings, but uh, I believe that I never expected that the uh, front pack labeling could be so polarized politically. <laughs> and, and if what the Commission brings to the Parliament uh, does not solve this polarization, uh, it's going to be quite complex that will go uh, through in the Parliament with a clear majority, which is why, what we always try. If it goes only by one vote, it's going to be problematic, not only when it comes to its legislation, this legislation itself, but the member states, if they're going to push it forward or not. So, so that's why I think that, that uh, or I hope that, that whatever the Commission brings is 
balanced enough to try to avoid the political use of this, because it's, at least in Spain, it has become highly political, highly political, because it's, as I said before, it's ideologically driven. If you use examples at Nutri-Score, and Chantal said something very, very true, that is, we are not saying if it's good or bad, but it's what you're actually doing. <laughs> so it doesn't matter they say it's not good or bad, but I always prefer to have an A in the exam than an E. And the consumer in five seconds is gonna is gonna react on those. Is there a model that you impulse. is there a model out there that you think could? That's that's the other thing. Uh, what is the model that is better? I think that to do this, not polarizing, probably we'll have to go to a more uh, or less simplistic uh, model, which is not perfect and will not be able to influence as much as Nutri-Score or other system that that are more simplistic could do. But maybe they are better, or at least it's better on how I perceive how these things should be, which is inform customers and not trying constantly to influence them in one direction or the other. I think they're adults and if they're good informed, they will make their decisions. Either if they're healthier or not, they're adults, they can do whatever they want. Chantal, what's your take on, on that? I think that the idea that a food is absolutely healthy or absolutely unhealthy is not necessarily a good way of seeing. I, th I know that consumers do tend to speak or think in black and white because in the end they put, they take or they do not take. So in the end it's a zero one type of information. But I do believe that the Nutri-Score at least tries not to provide this information in black and white. We do not say that it's not a binary system. Some of endorsement scheme, for example, only put the label on those that are the healthier ones. Other schemes only put labels on those that are less healthy, but we have an approach that is gradual. We have a, an average version of the C. It's average, it's in the middle. We don't know exactly where it would fall from a perspective of health. We do know yet that, well, in terms of what the Nutri-Score says or doesn't say, it's simply a tool of transparency of the information that is at the back of the pack. So if the food has an A or a B, you only need to see what's on the back of the pack, and it's just a translation of it. Claire, you're nodding. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking as well, but, I mean, it's not as if we're talking about any new way of providing information through mm. the evaluative schemes, not. I mean, the nutritional information is already on the back, as you say. So the at-a-glance color thing that you get, you can go behind and you can look and, and you can see. And Chenzo, you're, you were also slightly nodding. Do you have regrets <laughs> that Nutrient Form doesn't have the colors uh, that the other ones no. do? I mean, the, what I repeat, I go back to the to the logic of of the of the labeling. I mean, uh, uh, of course, I can understand that that the colors are um, attracting more uh, uh, people than than uh, 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 white, black and white. Okay, I mean, it's something which is experienced since uh, childhood. Uh, on the on the other side, uh, 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 and speaking of of transparency. Okay, we were referring to transparency. Uh, something which is really missing here as information is also what is behind, what is the algorithm which is behind Nutri-Score. And this is something concerning because if we are talking of correcting, I mean, uh, uh, the algorithm on the basis of the fact that we have to save this product or to save this other product, for me, this is like playing no, it's like playing the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, we just are entrusting the uh, education diet, I mean, education, the food education of people to an algorithm. I mean, I have my doubts that this could be the, 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 good, the good idea. Would you, but, would you like to respond? Or? Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, I think that... To believe that the Nutri-Score is going to be completely transforming the environment regarding the way people are informed about diets and about health is a bit reductive because we do have other systems and we do know that the Nutri-Score is not going to affect those. It needs to work in complementarity meaning that we do need to inform on food-based dietary guidelines because they are complementary to the approach. The question of correcting the algorithm is more on the question of improving the algorithm to ensure that it takes into account the last elements of the literature. The nutrient profile model initially was developed in 2005, so it was almost 20 years 
ago. So we do need to take into account the fact that the, well, the scientific field has evolved and some elements need to be taken into account now. So it's not more correcting, but rather evolving and it's natural to go evolving towards what science says. Claire, I, I, I know I've been told not to, that I won't get an answer, but will it be Nutri-Score? <laughs> <laughs> The Commission is not going to propose Nutri-Score, no. I mean, we, we are looking at a range of different evaluative schemes. Uh, we're weighing them uh, to see what the advantages of each of the different schemes are. Um, and I think what you say about not putting something on the table which polarises the debate is, of course, highly relevant. I mean, that's not what we want to do in the Commission. No? We want to have this label at EU level. We want to avoid 12 different member states coming up with different versions, you know, that we have uh, a whole jigsaw puzzle of different ways of looking at this. So we will try and find a way through. It's not easy, as the debate shows. Uh, but we will try and, uh, and avoid polarisation, and I very much hope that the Parliament as well. I mean, the difficulty, of course, is the closer we get to the elections, the more things become, um, how can I say, excited in terms of debates in the Parliament. Um, so, you know, we rely on you as well to make sure that there's a very level-headed debate on this to the extent that you can, no? and that we come out with something that's good for Europe huh? and good for everyone, including, okay. including the Mediterranean diet, which EFSA talked about as well. So. Now, uh, we've been talking a lot about Nutri-Inform and Nutri-Score as if they were the only two uh, labeling schemes out there, but of course uh, there are others, and are you taking lessons from some of them? In we're looking at all of them. We're looking at the range of different schemes that there are uh, across Europe. I mean, there are other countries, there are other continents that have already gone forward on front of back as well, the US and Canada. We're not, I mean, we, we are informed by what happens there because it's part of the global context, but we're impact assessing all the schemes in Europe that exist already. And uh, you mentioned that it wouldn't be called Nutri-Score. Do you already have a name for a new label? <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> um, Vincenzo, any thoughts on uh, from... from is, is, so you mentioned that Nutri it doesn't have to be Nutri-Inform. Why come up with it then? Uh, and why promote it in other countries? Because this is... Uh, sorry. Because this is what we are working on. And of course, we are <laughs> developing. We are not... We don't have the same... Uh, old tradition of 10 years working uh, that uh, Nutri-Score has. That's why we are not pretentious in this, in this case. But let me also say something about polarization. If there is polarization, I can tell you that in Italy, there is a, a very strange unanimity across all the <laughs> political <laughs> spectrum that <laughs> it's, uh, there are few things which make uh, uh, which unite people in, uh, and, and politicians <laughs> as, as this kind of discussion. And uh, is that only true for Italy? I think you mentioned Spain. <laughs> well, it's the same, but in Spain, it is true that the coalition government was completely divided on this. So the, 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 the extreme left uh, populist party that is in government was the one that pushed forward Nutri-Score uh, without even agreeing with, with the other side, with the Socialist Party, and that has created a huge problem because, as he said, in Spain, in almost, I mean, I'm not going to give a percentage because I don't have it, but the majority of producers and even citizens, they, they don't like the system. Those who have read about it, they just don't like it. They dislike it because probably for the same reasons of Italy. And this has been also a political tool. And, and a political weapon. And that's what I think that it's is nice what Claire said, that we have to avoid that. And not only that, imagine that if at the end what the Commission brings goes in the Nutri-Score direction, well, you're putting even more fuel in southern countries when it comes to really extremist uh, populist forces that they don't like the European Union that much. And this may sound stupid, but it's like, it's like this. So, so we have to, to be careful. Do you have a take on that? Or? Well, um, first of all, the Nutri-Score is not only a French tool, but it does, given that there are seven countries that have decided towards adopting or adopting completely the Nutri-Score, now it has set a transnational governance in which Spain actually participates in, with a steering committee that aims at coordinating the efforts to try and solve the issues that producers may have in implementing the Nutri-Score, and the scientific committee that is tasked to to update the algorithm with the idea of what we said before. So it is already some form of transnational cooperation around the question of the Nutri-Score. Whether it's uh, a political debate, uh, I mean, I'm a scientist, so I'm not entirely 
up to the question of politics because it's not my field of expertise. But we did make some... Um, there are studies that have investigated how Italian or even Spanish or Portuguese consumers react to different types of labels, comparing Nutrient Form to Nutri-Score. And they have shown that overall, Nutri-Score actually is rather well perceived. It helps them identify the products that are with the healthier uh, compositions. So we do have also data from studies in the field that tend to show that it's maybe more balanced that we see, but again, we all have our own lenses and the, um, our own ways of seeing things. I'm only dealing with scientific evidence right now. You shook your head at one point, I think. Uh, would you? Well, no? the, 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 the fact that the uh, Nutri-Score is uh, more advanced in the, in the sense of, develop, of development is something, of course, I was, uh, I was recognizing. I just have some doubts on the fact that it's so well received in, uh, uh, in Italy, but I'm not a scientist, so I, uh, so I don't want to enter in, the, <laughs> in another uh, field, of course. I'm just skeptical. <laughs> Um, Claire, any uh, any any thoughts, any more reflections on this process? Mm, no, I think it's been a very interesting debate. Um, I, I think, yeah, just from from the Commission's side, uh, we're concerned about consumers getting clear information, and we're consumed we're concerned about the internal market as well. And we think, really, um, you know, now is the time to to act. Um, what's out there at the moment has showed some results, uh, but it's not perfect, as you say. So I think now is really the time to have a debate at European level about what we want to do for our consumers, because we're falling behind in the rest of the world, to be honest, on, on the food labelling now. I mean, we, we were out there at one point, but now we're falling behind, so it's, it's time to do something. Do you think part of this uh, kind of the reason why Nutri-Score has become such a polarised, or Nutri-Score versus other labels, um, it has to do with the cultural values uh, in, it seems like the southern countries are, um, yeah, they, they have their dietary preferences and, and, and dietary traditions. Is, 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 is culture kind of, you, you mentioned you're a scientist and you're not a politician, is, is culture and, and tradition influencing the process here a lot? Uh, and the reason why it's so polarized now? If I speak for Italy, the answer is yes, because there are, there are factors which are linked to the, the fact that we... I mean, there is uh, something which, of course, is... Uh, uh, I'm going to say it's a mistake that sometimes the Europe ma makes. And when I say Europe, of course, I include the Council, so the member states, uh, which is to think that one size fits all approach is the correct one. And this, uh, the way it is perceived in the Nutri-Score is exactly this. I mean, the fact that there is a, a one-size-fits-all approach, which is running counter the traditional Mediterranean diet, which is something which distinguishes, of course, the southern countries as compared to the Nordic countries. I'm not saying that Nordic countries get the superiority of the Mediterranean diet, because, of course, uh, doctors and scientists, they say that, that the Nordic uh, diet is as good uh, as the Mediterranean diet. But this proves something. This proves, in, our, in my view, that there are different kinds of traditions. And again, what is important is the combination of the products is not the way the single product is conceived. Or at least it's not only this, but it's the, the healthy diet. And of course, when uh, the strategy farm to fork speaks of, uh, of labeling, it is making the link to the diet, not to the products. Uh, well, um, um, it's interesting because when it comes to politics and these things, there's always some science as well you know, social science, but we do our pollings and we do our things. And it's interesting enough that in my party, we launched a very big poll uh, in August, and for the first time, we included a question about this. Not a Nutri-Score, because most of the people doesn't know what Nutri-Score, we said, what will you prefer, a system that leads you to your one decision or a system that informs you to make your own decision? And the result was, I mean, absolutely clear. So 
it's not only the science of, of, of what the Nutri-Score does or the front pack labeling does. We have to include there how it affects to the decision of citizens and if, if to what extent we want to influence that. And for me, that's the cornerstone of this debate. Chantal, any thoughts uh, before we end? <laughs> Well, I think that indeed taking into account dietary perspectives and specific regional information is important. Again, I don't believe that one system or another is against some type of diet. Again, diet is a combination of foods, but we are talking about front to back labeling. So including elements on the diet, which goes way beyond the simple question of do I put it, do I pick it up on the shelf? It's still another milestone that we need to achieve, how to go beyond the question of the way you select your food and then how you prepare it home. So there is still other elements to be taken into account. Front to back labeling is not going to help specifically on how to combine foods to have a healthy diet. It's only one part of the question. What we do also know is that it's not just a question of how consumers do perceive it. It's also a very hot topic in, question, in terms of how the various sectors do re react to uh, the information. And indeed, some sectors are more against, opposed to the nutrition score as others, because technically, yes, uh, candies and uh, biscuits and cheese and processed meat are all technically fat, salty, sugary. So when we translate the information that is on the back of the pack, that's the information that we provide. So it's only a question of what is the key target here? Are we still talking about the consumer, the health of the consumer and how to improve the food environment in general? And finally, we're over time, but uh, Claire, uh, final word for the Commission. I would just say, and I'm picking up on what you were saying as well, that we're not choosing for the consumers. We're giving them the tools to make their own choices. That's that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, let's let's uh, <laughs> let's conclude it here, I guess. Um, we'll see. Uh, it seems like we're not that far off from the commission proposal, so I, I suppose everyone will be looking, um, looking, looking, looking with anticipation to what it will be, and then we'll have the debates in the council and the parliament. Um, I have a. Yeah, please remain seated. Um, just looking at the notes. We need a. Uh, no, that's for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a we have a we have a poll that uh, Yara was running before um, with, the, with the question of uh, food systems currently account for more than one third of global CO two emissions. Switching to fossil free green fertilizers produced using renewable electricity instead of natural carbon can reduce the carbon footprint of certain crops by. And I know the answer, but I wonder if anyone wants to. <laughs> It could reduce, switching to green fertilizers will reduce the carbon footprint of certain crops by between 10 to 30%. So 10 to 30% that green fertilizers could help reduce carbon footprint of certain crops. Um, next up we have, um, just. <laughs> putting, yes. Uh, next, next up, we have a session moderated by my colleague Saim. Uh, it's on the putting putting the price on food. So it's on. Yeah. Uh, stay tuned and 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 do remain seated, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>